welcome all my friends, my brothers, and my sisters, and everyone interested in this ancient text called the Bible, written hundreds, thousands of years ago, and yet is supposed to mean something to us today. And at Dumb Christian, we're going to explore this often confusing, sometimes disturbing book. And as we do, uh, we might get a little colorful, excited, maybe even unnecessary. So buckle up and welcome to the Dumb Christian Podcast. The Bible is not this uh, neatly wrapped package or a bottle of filtered water. It is a no holds barred look at the broken world, the depravity around us, and what God is doing to work within that system to redeem it and to do what he can to salvage humanity and creation. Because it is a gritty book, it includes some very delicate things, so listeners beware. Uh, it includes some themes and topics such as rape and incest, both of which are going to be a part of our story that we look at today. And we need to take some time to wrestle with what are these types of things doing in a book that's supposed to teach us that God is good? Well, the Bible's about to get very real. So, let's go! The stories that we're going to look at um, today are found in Genesis chapter 19, and I highly recommend go read Genesis chapter 19 on your own. Um, at Dumb Christian, we're just trying to look at it with modern language and sensibilities and trying to just unpack what's going on. But ultimately, God said what he said the way he wanted to say it, and he'll always say it better than I can say it. So I recommend giving that a read on your own, Genesis chapter 19. But before we can get into the stories that we're going to look at in Genesis 19, we really need to take some uh, a some uh, context. We need to look at some context. What's going on around the story? What's going on in the world? What's going on in the culture? What's going on in the lives of the people that we're looking at? And uh, really, I highly recommend this is the way we need to approach the Bible anytime we read it. Get context. What's going on? And there's an episode uh, in Dumb Christian called How to Hermeneutics. I highly recommend checking that out. That'll give you some groundwork. How do we approach reading the Bible? So let's back up a few chapters before we get into Genesis chapter 19 and take a look at the world in this time. The characters that we're going to be focusing on eventually are Lot and his two daughters. But before we get to him, we need to meet a very famous man in the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard about him, Abraham. And Abraham and his family are living in the ancient land of Sumer. Sumer was the hotbed of society. It was the uh, cultural hub of the world at that day. This is where you come to uh, tr make trades, sell your wares, and, and post your Instagram pictures. This is where you went to gain followers. And in Sumer, there was a city called Ur. Everyone say Ur. Good job. Well done. Nice. Ur was the epitome of what society could look like in that day, the highest level of civilization. And there was this saying that became very popular that maybe you've heard before, and it goes, there's nothing new under the sun. In Ur, it was as good as it ever was, and it's as good as it ever would be. There's nothing greater than what Ur has accomplished in regards to uh, standard of living, jobs, society, culture. And it carried with it this idea that it doesn't matter what you do, all your the, all you're ever going to do is reinvent the wheel, no matter how hard you try to create something new. You're not going to create any new jobs. You're not going to create any new avenues of income. What your grandfather did, what your father did is what you do, what your kids will do, and what their kids will do forever and ever and ever. This is, life is cyclical. What goes around comes around and nothing new 
ever comes about. There's nothing new under the sun. So there's no reason to go exploring what the next town over has. There's no indeed for you to post your resume. There's no, the grass isn't greener on the other side. And so when you finally get to the other town, it's really just a worse version of Ur. Now, Ur was a very eclectic uh, collection of people groups and ethnicities. It was economically diverse, but it was also very religiously diverse. And with this religious diversity came innumerable pagans. And these pagan religions brought with them pagan religion, religious worship practices. It's, it includes, but is not limited to, uh, cult prostitution, child prostitution, human trafficking, child sacrifice, just to name a few. Now, there was a rule of the land. There was a, a king and a, a law. But morally speaking... It was the Wild West. Anything could go and anything did go. And this is the epitome. This is the highest level of culture in that day. And it is glorifying some really dark, perverted, twisted actions under the guise of religious worship. But this is the cycle. There's nothing new. You can't break the cycle. There's no point. There's nothing else out there. And this is the city where we meet Abraham. For whatever reason, God picks Abraham. We don't know why. We do know later that Abraham becomes one of God's best friends. But God surveys the world, picks Abraham and says, Hey, I'm going to use you to create something new. We're actually going to break the cycle of this depravity and this brokenness that just continues to repeat itself and just effectively gets worse and worse and worse. We're going to create a brand new society, a brand new culture that actually in the long run is going to bless the entire world. But to create this new thing, you can't do it in the city. This life that you've built for yourself, these friends that you've surrounded yourself with, these hobbies and these habits and these addictions that you're stuck in, we can't create this new thing while you're in the city. So God says to Abraham, I need you to collect your whole family. Everyone that you're responsible for, I need you to take your whole family and leave the city. Because if you surround yourself with the city, it's it's what you surround yourself with is, is what you embrace. It, it will rub off on you no matter how hard you try. You surround yourself with people who laugh weird. Your laugh is going to start to sound weird too. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, Abraham was um, what one of these $5 taboo words that we can't talk about anymore. He was the patriarch of his family. We need to understand that patriarch is not this word that means um, a male can just do whatever he wants to his family and his wife has to be submissive and he can abuse and manipulate and harass and, and he can get away with any type of activity that he wants to because he's the patriarch. He's in charge. No, that's not what the patriarch means. Patriarch is the title given to the um, oldest mentally capable male in the family, and he is responsible for his family. He is responsible to protect them, to provide for them, and to prepare them for life, to equip them for what life is going to bring, to equip them to carry on, to be able to earn their living, to be able to raise their family, to be able to take over the role of protecting, providing, and preparing. This is what it means to be a patriarch, and Abraham is responsible for his whole family. Now, in the ancient world, the families would live together, even uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews. And so God says, take your whole family. Abraham packs up all of his DVDs and he wraps up his Casper mattress back in its original packaging. And he gathers all of his family members, which include a man named Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew. So he gathers everyone and they start to head west. God doesn't tell him where he's going. He just says, follow me and I'll get you there 
eventually. So Abraham and his whole family head west, sometimes north, sometimes south, but ultimately west like 600 miles or something. And it's it's probably even more than that because they went up and down and they had to navigate this mountainous region. And this is like something straight out of the Lord of the Rings. It is uh, full of battles and adventures, and Abraham has to go rescue his family from invading armies. They have to walk and navigate through uh, foreign uh, politics and other nations until they finally end up where God brings them, the land of Canaan. And even Abraham's father dies on this journey. And all the while they're going through this process, they're trusting God as even though everything's happening to them, they continue to trust God. You're going to take us where you promised you'd take us so that we can create something new and incredible that will change the world. And because they continued to obey, regardless of everything else that's going on, God begins to bless them abundantly. He increases their livestock, their flocks, and their wealth, and their possessions. And even as God blesses them, this new tribe, this new Abraham clan, moves into the land of Canaan, and all these other tribes begin to take note. Who's the new neighbor here in the land of Canaan? Canaan is located in modern-day Israel, and this is the location where God is going to establish a nation of people through whom he can bring about salvation and that redemption of humanity and and all of creation, the Messiah, the chosen one, Jesus, by the way, spoiler alert, sorry. And these other tribes, they begin to take notice and they're like, oh, who is this tribe? What's going on here? I want to know more about this. And so not only does God bless them in their provisions and their prosperity, but also people are joining the tribe uh, that Abraham is, has established in this new land. And they're growing so much that um, Abraham's shepherds begin fighting with lots shepherds because they're running out of room. And when it's time to feed the sheep, they overlap and they have, uh, they end up fighting each other. And so Abraham says to Lot, I tell you what, why don't you take your part of the tribe, your part of the clan, take your shepherds, your flocks, all your possessions, your wealth, and let's double our efforts. Let's actually expand the way that we can accomplish God's mission for us. God called us out of the city so that we could create a new society, a new culture where God is honored and people are honored as being divine image bearers. Let's double our efforts. You take God's mission and do it over there. I'll do it over here. And we'll have a greater impact. And so Lot takes up his part of the clan and heads off on his own. And what this means is now Lot is the patriarch of his family. He's now responsible to prepare, provide, and protect. All of his family. Well, just like the 28-year-old who, for the first time ever, moves out of mom and dad's basement, discovers that the freedom of independence ain't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, It's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to be the patriarch, to be responsible, to to pay insurance and put gas in the car and the mortgage payment and keep the sheep happy. And so what does Lot do? He settles right back down into the very thing God called him out of and sets up shop in the twin sin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are like the most vile cities in the world that, I mean, worse than what we've got today. And we'll take a look at how bad they were. But you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy than Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were having such a devastating impact on creation that uh, they were what they were producing, it was spilling out through the city and corrupting everything around it. So much so that God said, we got to stop this. We have to put an end to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy the twin sin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
So God grabs a couple of his angel buddies and they come down to earth. And as they're passing through the neighborhood on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, God looks at his angel buddies and says, hey, I think Abe lives around here. Let's stop by and see what he's up to. So they walk in, scrolling, uh, strolling into the up the driveway and Abraham's out back with a, a pipe, just admiring the, the clouds and the rolling hills and supervising his shepherds. And God announces himself. <clears throat> Abraham whips his head over. God, what are you doing here? This is crazy. And he says, well, you know, we were in town. We had some stuff to do. And I thought I'd swing by, see what you're up to. Abraham says, hey, can I give you guys some dinner? Are you guys hungry? Yeah, yeah, we could eat. So he has his uh, wife make up some, uh, you know, some steaks, some real good ribeyes, uh, some Hawaiian rolls, uh, Caesar salad, and and top shelf box wine. Mm. Oh, yeah. We're talking like no expense spared. So they have dinner and they're eating together and the angel buddies kind of finish up, wipe their mouth. All right, that was great. Thanks. But we we got some important stuff we got to do. So uh, we need to be heading out. God, you coming? And he looks up and he says, you guys go on without me. I'll catch up. I'll catch up. I'm going to hang out with, with Abe, Abe for a little bit. Abraham looks a little confused and says, what are they doing? And God says, well, uh, they're going to obliterate Sodom and Gomorrah. They're just going to wipe it off the face of the earth. Total destruction, nothing left. And instantly Abraham thinks, oh, shit, that's where Lot lives. Uh, hold up, guys. Wait a second. And he turns back to God and he says, wait, wait, wait. you're just going to totally destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? What about the good people that live there? And the angels just start like giggling to themselves like good people. Right. I'm so sure. But Abraham's like, surely you're not going to destroy all the good people in Sodom and Gomorrah along with all the evil people. And, and God says, I'm listening. I'm listening. So Abraham says, well, what if you find 50 people worth saving? What if you find 40, 30, 20, 10? He gets God down to 10 people. And God says, I'll tell you what, if I can find 10 righteous people, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we need to make a quick note here to understand that righteousness is not the same thing as being a good person. I think in our own lives, we would acknowledge and we can see in history and there's plenty of examples in scripture that once people start to do what they think is good in their own eyes, things get chaotic really fast because not everyone thinks the same things are good. And some things that one person think are good might be bad to another person. And this, you can see, uh, doesn't really measure up to a very good situation. Very quickly, it's going to fall into calamity. And so God says, if I can find 10 righteous people, people who agree that what God says is good, is what's good, and choose to live according to the way God says is the good way to live, the right way to live. So if I can find 10 righteous people, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abraham's just like sitting there hoping against all hope that Lot has been choosing to live according to the way God said is good. And this is where that all that was introduction. Finally, we are reaching Genesis chapter 19. This is the beginning of the stories that I want to look at. So these two angels walk into town. Now, they're angels. And although they're not in their truest biblical sense, covered in eyes and wings and weird creature heads, um, they, they look like people, but they don't look like the hobo wearing Goodwill hand-me-downs. No, no, no. They got fresh, full, clean, shaven beards. They're wearing the latest Vera Wang, smell like Gucci Mang, got that $400 haircut, popping tags, right? And they look good. They look really good. And as they walk into the town square of Sodom and Gomorrah, they are greeted with a bunch of dirtbags who are catcalling, whistling, hollering, hey, you good looking, why don't you come over here? I'll show you something. Why don't you sit on my lap? In the ancient world, it was customary that if you made your way into 
if someone, a stranger, came to your town and was in the town square, you would go out of your way to make sure they had everything that they needed. Take care of their needs. If they need food, water, a place to stay, you make sure you take care of them. Because if you were on a journey in, an, uh, in a new town, you would hope that someone would help take care of your needs. This is the way that it was supposed to be done, but not in Sodom and Gomorrah. No, instead of looking for ways to take care of these two newcomers, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah were looking for ways to take advantage of, harass, abuse, and get what they can get out of these guys. And it's no secret they were looking for ways to sexually abuse and rape these guys. Lot was out running um, some errands and on his way back with some groceries, he makes his way through the town square and notices these two guys. He, he takes a note of these two guys. They look very different. Um, I don't, we don't know his relationship with God, but Lot traveled and lived with Abraham under the, ro- the responsibility and the leadership of Abraham. So he at least knows about God and is familiar with the divine and the spirit realm, and he takes note and says, these guys have been in the presence of God. There's something about these guys. And so Lot recognizes that there's this crowd amassing around them, harassing them, catcalling them, pressing in. And he knows that if he doesn't do something, um, if he doesn't intervene, the shit's going to hit the fan. And so whatever Lot's thinking, I don't know if he's thinking he needs to save these angels from the town that he knows what they'll do to them, or he's thinking I need to try and save the town from being destroyed by these two angels. Whatever it is, Lot thinks I need to intervene. And so he steps in and says, guys, come over here. Uh, I'll, I'll take care of you and we can get away from this crowd that's amassing. Come and stay at my house. I'll take care of you. And as they're rushing to Lot's house, this... <coughs> As they're rushing to Lot's house, this crowd begins to grow and it amasses and um, people are starting to get angry and they're pressing in. Hey, where are you going? Get back here. Finally, they get to Lot's house and he says to the guys, you guys leave these fellows alone, please. They're under my care. Don't do this evil thing that you are planning to do, which is not hospitable. It is not gracious. It's not good. You are actively looking for ways to rape, abuse, and probably murder these two strangers. And then they just get pissed off at him. Who do you think you are coming to live here? And now you're trying to be our judge and tell us what to be like. We're going to deal worsely with you than we would have with those guys. And he freaks out. Lot is in a really bad position. Have you, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you have no good options? Like every choice available to you is bad. And no matter what you choose, no matter what action you take, um, you've just dug your own grave. This is the situation Lot finds himself in. He knows he needs to intervene. There's something he needs to do. He needs to stand up. He can't just go with the crowd, but he doesn't know what else to do. And there's a lot of other historical context that we don't have time to get into. But in a moment of weakness and fear and and panic, Lot offers his daughters. He says, look, don't do anything to these guys, but you can take my virgin daughters and do whatever you want to them. This was a last panic, freak out response. This was not one of the first options that he would go to. He doesn't know what else to do. He has no good options. And he knows that this crowd will rape, abuse, and probably kill his daughters. But what else can he do? He doesn't have any good options. I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's good. Scripture doesn't tell us that it's good. Scripture just takes a cold, hard look at this is the reality of the situation that they found themselves in. And it's not good. 
Luckily, the angels don't let that happen. They grab Lot, they bring him in, and they strike the perverts with blindness. They're just groping and molesting each other now, trying to find Lot and his daughters and these angels. They're inside. Once they have a moment to catch their breath, collect themselves, the angels say, Okay, we are here because of that. We're here to wipe that out. We're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We are going to obliterate it. You need to get out of Dodge now. But I can't. I have a family here. We have a life. We have a business. I even have brothers, uh, sons-in-law that who, who are betrothed to marry my daughters. We can't just pack up and leave. Angels say, no, no, you don't understand. We're doing this now. You get out now or you don't get out at all. So a uh, Lot runs downtown to the factory where his sons-in-law work, and he's, the sky is falling, the end is near, we have to leave now. And his sons just look at each other, their co-workers, sorry, my dad's a little, a few fries short of a happy meal, just ignore him, and, and they turn back to the assembly line and go back to work. Lot realizes that this is not a losing battle, so he heads back to his house to get his uh, china packed and his suitcases full. And the angels say, no, you have to leave now. And they're humming and hawing and he's kicking and he's not... He's kicking stones and he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So finally, the angels grab him, his two daughters and his wife, take them to the edge of the city and say, go now. And they start to flee. And it's like something straight out of San Andreas where the road is collapsing right behind the car as it just barely escapes town. And there's explosions and there's fire and stones falling from the sky. And Australia is like WTF, mate. And it's so chaotic. There's people dying in the streets, screaming. And they flee for their lives. In the chaos, Lot's wife dies. As they were running towards safety, as they were running towards God's provision of salvation and and saving them from the destruction happening to the city, Lot's wife remembers what she's leaving behind. All of her friends. The cafe on the corner that she would have coffee with her girlfriends every Thursday. The bridge club. Everything that she had built for herself. All the aspects of life that she loved. And she was leaving those things behind. So she looks back at the city. She looked back. Instead of looking forward to the good gift that was granted to her to escape the destruction of the city, she longs for and looks back at the city. In this moment, Genesis 19 tells us that she was turned into a pillar of salt. A pillar is, can be, maybe it's like a monument, like a statue used to remind those that look at it about something significant, a historical event, an experience that they had had. And it says she turned into a pillar of salt, a monument of salt, a reminder made out of salt. In the ancient world, salt was primarily used, yes, for flavor, but even more so for preservation. Meat would go bad quickly because they didn't have refrigeration, but you could put salt on meat and it would preserve the meat and it would last a lot longer. It wouldn't rot. It wouldn't go corrupt. It would preserve the meat. So this monument was made out of salt to not just remind them of the destruction of the city, but to remind all the onlookers that God preserves and saves and his salvation doesn't happen in the brokenness. It happens, that's where he met the family, right? He met them in the city, in the depravity, in the brokenness. That's where he met them and then drew them out. And this pillar of salt, this monument of preservation is a reminder that God meets us in the city but his salvation removes us from it. 
And if we long for and look back at the city, we're going to miss the way he's trying to work his goodness in our lives. And Lot and his two daughters keep going and they flee and they find themselves in this small town called Zoar, which is at the edge of the valley. But uh, edge of the valley. But when they turn back and look, the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah is getting bigger and bigger. And it's not just saying within the boundaries of the city limits, but it's um, expanding through the whole valley and it's getting closer and closer to Zoar. And so they start to freak out and they're like, "Well, we can't stay here. We got to keep going." So they press onward and inward until they find themselves in the mountains. Now, they are part of the family bloodline and the lineage of Noah. They would have heard the stories of Noah and the flood, God's wrath when he wiped out all of creation. And so it's not unreasonable for them to now begin to think God did it again. He wiped out everyone on the earth, and we are the last remaining family. God must want to start over with us. That's why he saved us from total destruction. And the daughters are thinking, well, our husbands are dead, and our dad's mother died. You can see where this gets really messy really quick. They have a conversation, Dad, we need to repopulate the earth. And he says, well, it ain't happening the way you think it's going to happen. I'm not having sex with my daughters. Um, but they're, again, in this difficult place with no good options. And the Bible is not this neatly wrapped package or a bottle of filtered water. It's a no-holds-barred look at what the people in the world do when they follow what they think is good. And they're trying, now, granted, they're trying to do what they think God must have saved them for. We, we must need to repopulate the earth. So the two daughters conspire and they say, let's get dad really drunk. No one's looking forward to it. It's not what God asked them to do. It's not what God wants them to do, but they're just doing what they think is best. They get dad totally wasted. And the first night, the oldest daughter goes in. He is so drunk. He has no idea what's going on. She has sex with her dad and she gets pregnant. The next night, they do it again, get dad totally blasted. The youngest daughter goes in, has sex with dad, gets pregnant. And... I can't imagine what their reaction was the first time they actually dis- met other people and realized, oh, we aren't the last human beings alive. You've got to be kidding me. Damn it. But this is the Bible. It's messy and it's unfiltered. And it's good for us to see that God meets us in the middle of the city, in the middle of the brokenness, even when we keep making just bad choices. And he's doing everything he can to bring us out of that brokenness, out of that depravity, into something new and good and right. And sometimes we have to walk through those stories in the Bible that are uncomfortable, maybe even disturbing. But that's the Bible. And I have been your host, The Dumb Christian. And remember that even if we're dumb, doesn't mean we're stupid. I love you guys. Next time. Special shout out to Holly Habercorn and thank you for listening to Dumb Christian. Uh, leave a comment, leave a review. Let me know what you liked, what you'd like to hear more of. Share it with your friends, with your family, and let's go on this journey together. Catch you later. Love you guys. Dumb, 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 dumb.